Howdy friends, Dr. L. Nightrunner here. Howdy friends, Dr. L. Nightrunner here. Ah, oh, fuck, 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 okay. <clears throat> Howdy friends, Dr. L. Nightrunner here with a special episode. In tonight's edition, we're going to ask the question, should we care what Western academics have to say about psilocybin mushrooms? Now you may wonder why I'm dressed like this. It's to let you know I'm legitimate. Got my stethoscope. Cheekiness aside, we have a long and storied history with psilocybin mushrooms as well as mescaline here in the Americas. Incas, Mayans, and my ancestors, the Olmecs and Aztecs, all partook in mushroom ceremonies. Other substances like peyote, fermented drinks, even toads were used. If there was a way to converse with the gods, our peoples were all about it. That was, of course, until Catholic Spaniards came, and once they were able to gain a foothold on the region, their monks went to work, vilifying mushrooms as tools of the devil, and then, of course, going on to commit mass genocide. Most of the United States wouldn't know about magic mushrooms until the 20th century. 1950s Mexico marks a key time of mushroom resurgence in the United States. Wasson made contact with the Mazatec people. The Mazatec people are from the northern Oaxaca region in Mexico. And this is where he met the famed Maria Sabina. Maria Sabina was the first known curandera to open her doors to Western tourists. A curandera is essentially a shaman, somebody who guides the mushroom ritual. And thus Wasson and one of his friends became the first known Americans to partake in the mushroom ritual under the guidance of Maria Sabina. Upon returning to the United States, Wasson gave an interview to Time Magazine about his trip to the Oaxaca region. Following publicity began an influx of people from the US making the voyage to Maria Sabina, everyone ranging from scientists, hippies, and celebrities. Unfortunately, this would ultimately become a problem for Maria Sabina, as well as her village, as the influx of Westerners would attract the attention of Mexican authorities. It put the Mazatec way of life and the observation of mushroom rituals at risk. As a result, Maria Sabina was ostracized from her community. The hostility was so bad that her house was even burnt down. In later interviews, she would express regret over introducing Wasson to these practices. She remarked, before Wasson, nobody took the children, children in this case meaning mushrooms, mushrooms are the children. Before Wasson, nobody took the children simply to find God. They were always taken to cure the sick. I find this to be a revealing quote, to me it captures the ego of Western civilization, an ancient sacrament only being as good as its function in a capitalist society. Doing mushrooms for these Westerners seemed to be an attempt at getting a leg up in their society, in their world. And of course the irony in all of this is that these people would take their revelations back to the United States in order to further erode communities like the Mazatec by expanding the capitalist state. Wasson also brought species of these mushrooms to France, where they were immediately synthesized by Albert Hoffman. Does that name sound familiar? Is he from fucking Switzerland? Albert Hoffman is the Swiss scientist that first discovered and synthesized LSD, known for the famous bicycle ride. It was later revealed that Wasson's Mexican expeditions were secretly funded by CIA's mind control project MK Ultra. This is an ominous detail concerning his research in the area. Defenders of Wasson have always claimed that Wasson was unwitting to the cooperation with the CIA. Sounds a little suspect to me. As I mentioned earlier, Maria Sabina welcomed a bunch of Westerners to take part in her mushroom rituals. Among those Westerners were a variety of people including hippies and scientists. One of the scientists to head that way was PhD Dr. Timothy Leary. Dr. Timothy Leary came to the Oaxaca region in 1960. He was, of course, also in search of the magic mushrooms. And although he did not go through with the curandera ritual, he did take these mushrooms at the resort in which he was staying at at the time, where he had his revelation to continue his work in the United States. Thus, the Harvard Psilocybin Project was born. Mushrooms, and really most all hallucinogens, are legal at this time. Timothy Leary is generally associated with LSD, but his study, the Harvard Psilocybin Project, involved mushrooms and LSD. This went from 1960 to 1962. It was started after Leary had a life-altering encounter with psilocybin mushrooms in Mexico. Leary also conducted the Concord Prison Experiment from 1961 to 1963. This experiment only used psilocybin mushrooms. 
Leary's reputation seems to be mixed within his scientific peers. Procedural irregularities and the perception of flippant attitudes worked against Leary and his partner Richard Alpert, ultimately leading to both of their dismissals from Harvard in 1963, abruptly ending all studies conducted. Leary's Harvard studies didn't necessarily get any fair press, but Leary also didn't do himself any favors with the nature of his involvement with these projects. The alleged broken protocols, experimental irregularities, lack of random sampling, and there were even rumors of using LSD with test subjects. There were even rumors of undergraduate students being forced or pressured into the project. These factors all contributed to Leary's dismissal. The Concord Prison Experiment, though criticized, didn't turn into the shit show that the uh, Harvard experiments did. At the heart of the hypotheses of the Concord experiments was recidivism, and for all intents and purposes it seems that an, a reasonable amount of data was extrapolated. Again, there was criticism of experimental irregularities, but it's arguable that some of those were unavoidable due to the constraints of working within a prison. Let me say that Timothy Leary was essentially guilty of doing what most of his counterculture, baby boomer counterparts were guilty of doing, and that's ruining it for the rest of us. By pushing an edgy philosophy over substance without considering the consequences. Because at some point, Timothy Leary might as well have just written a letter to Congress suggesting that they make hallucinogens illegal. His buffoonery shone a light on hallucinogens, one bright enough for the cops to see. He gained the ire of some government agencies, and here we are, acid and mushrooms are both illegal. Thanks a lot, dude. Thanks for that, Timothy Leary. Timothy Leary would go on to have a slew of legal problems. He spent time in exile for drug possession charges in the United States, and he would go on to live on the run for years. He even escaped from prison at one point. Eventually, the U.S. caught up to him, and he was incarcerated for a 15, or he was convicted for 15 years. That sentence was reduced when Timothy Leary became... An informant for the FBI. Now, a lot of his friends defended him, saying that he fed him shit and kept him in the dark. But, uh, who knows? Who knows? <laughs> By my count, we got two squeals so far, but, uh, what do I know? Bottom line, Timothy Leary acted extremely irresponsibly. Now, don't get me wrong, I certainly appreciate Dr. Leary's extensive research of LSD. I appreciate his promotion of LSD to the world. Leary knew Albert Hoffman personally, the man who discovered LSD. I fully concede his qualifications to teach the world about LSD. But a doctor of psychology is neither a mycologist or a botanist, and most likely isn't a shaman. Definitely not a shaman. Leary was out of his depth when it came to the larger picture of psilocybin. Thus, he didn't do any favors for mushrooms, and that's unfortunate. However, he spent enough time with mushrooms to get them mixed into the shuffle with LSD, at least as far as the public was concerned. And because of this carelessness, the Mazatec medicine was demonized and prohibited again. And see, we have to understand, when something is prohibited, it means that the general public has limited study of it. It also means that the wealthy have better access to it. Thus, mushrooms and peyote were just added to the arsenals of 1960s and 70s drugs of choice. Just some new items in Hunter S. Thompson's briefcase of gasoline to huff, ether, and God only knows what's adrenal glands. But, 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 I will say that I don't think, and this is my opinion, this opinion is based off of experience, but it is nonetheless my opinion. Mind expanding drugs tend not to work under the influence of, or the combination with ego expanding drugs. For example, cocaine, speed, quaaludes, you know. I mean, forgive me for thinking that uh, Maria Sabina wouldn't be into blowing lines. Let's talk about Terrence McKenna, the Timothy Leary of the 90s. The Timothy Leary of the 90s. I'm not sure if you'd want that title if you paid close attention. Terrence McKenna gave the world the gift of home grow operations. Thank you, dude. Uh, and that's awesome because, let me be clear, the Western world should have access to psilocybin. Uh, Cubensis have a wide range in the world, they belong to everybody. Unlike Leary, Terence McKenna was involved in the science of mushrooms rather than pharmaceuticals. He was an ethnobotanist, uh, which to my knowledge is somebody who studies different cultures and their relations to plant medicine. He inspired ayahuasca retreats, which are very popular now. 
Thousands of tourists go to places like Mexico, Peru, and Colombia every year in great part thanks to people like Terrence McKenna. It sounds fine. People from the United States should be out to understand other cultures. But you know how the fuck we do in other countries. Because it's people from the United States who are out seeking help from these communities. People from the US are guests in these communities. Therefore, any intrusion is way too much when you're seeking help from people that have less than you. Most of all, by virtue of being American, your entire way of life, your entire system of economic freedom is in some way connected to the parasitism that Latin American countries experience in relation to the United States. In the interest of staying on task, I'm not going to get into the whole geopolitical history of this phenomenon uh, because it's extensively documented every single country. Westerners absolutely have a responsibility to minimize their imprint in these communities. By virtue of the power dynamic that the United States possesses over countries in the Americas, uh, psychedelic tourism becomes less voluntary for many of these people. It's one of few ways to maintain their way of life as industry encroaches on their land. Terence McKenna, by virtue of his economic and geographic place in the world, experienced the upper hand in a power dynamic. He was able to travel the world and combine multiple philosophies into the doctrine that he would speak on. His studies of shamanism were rooted in Eastern religion. He received a degree from Berkeley in shamanism. A degree in shamanism. Like they're like, here, you take all the ayahuasca you want. Shaman. But I mean, you know, McKenna was kind of like the Anthony Bourdain of drugs for a while. He went through what he called an opium and Kabbalah phase in Jerusalem. He smuggled hash in Tibet. Got caught, I guess. That's crazy. I'm not scared of the police. I'm terrified of getting caught selling hash in other countries. Do you think he narked too? Then he went on to be a butterfly collector in Indonesia and uh, eventually on to uh, Colombia in search of the DMT. Anyway, that all sounds awesome and I really enjoy uh, the shared experiences from McKenna. He had a great opportunity to live an interesting and certainly perspective broadening life and, and the sharing of these experiences has made the world a better place. No doubt about it. And that's it, I'm not gonna butt that. I'm not here to oppose Terrence McKenna. My goal is to give some perspective, maybe rethink a few things. We can't control who our teachers have been in the moment. You know, when you're dealing with illegal drugs, um, you take what you can get. There aren't a lot of people that are brave enough to speak on these things. We come back to what Maria Sabina said about uh, the children, about mushrooms. Are you trying to heal or are you trying to meet your God? Are you doing ayahuasca in order to get better at capitalism? There is a philosophical problem with utilizing something while expediting its extinction. McKenna was fortunate enough to go all over the world and just kind of adopt an everything philosophy that was kind of a hybridization of all the other cultures the, that he got to observe joining Eastern and Western practices and thus becoming uh, an authority on shamanism. And it all feels, that's where I get a little impatient. It all feels very nose deaf. And systematically, it doesn't sit right. The insinuation is that we wouldn't have all of this great shamanic insight if it weren't for privileged Westerners sharing the enlightenment of their drug-fueled travels abroad. It inherently sets a precedent for the harm of indigenous communities as a result of the system that benefits Westerners by creating access to another exploitative market. It reduces indigenous communities to learning grounds for Westerners with something big to offer America, to offer capitalism. It becomes American-centric. These are not intended consequences from Terrence McKenna. I have absolutely no doubt that he meant the best, you know, they had the best intentions. Timothy Leary, I'm not so fucking sure. The experiences and philosophies of Leary and McKenna in particular are rooted in privilege and insulation. The insulation of wealth and legal protection. Much of their philosophies won't work for people in marginalized and targeted communities. It's one thing to have psychedelic revelations about one's life, but it's only as good as the access to what one has to see it through. 
and of course the connections one has to get out of trouble for using prohibited substances. So you can go into the experience with a clear mind, you know what I'm saying? By commodifying psychedelic tourism, it inherently expedites access to those with the means to attain it, rather than those who need it. And I think you can easily argue that to be in direct philosophical opposition of the intention of these healing rituals. That's why... That's why appropriating shamanism is such a problem. Buying your way into shamanism seems to be the literal definition of its downfall. And it's possible that someone who is on the lower side of a power dynamic may tell you that it's okay, but it certainly doesn't make it so. Consent under duress is not consent. The appreciation of shamanic medicine, especially in the context of shamanism in the Americas, needs to be predicated on the protection of those very communities from whom we seek knowledge. So what can we do? How can we improve upon this discussion? What are the positives here? Well, first let me say that the decriminalization of psilocybin mushrooms here in my home city of Denver, as well as in Portland, Oregon, uh, I believe, are both outstanding moves forward. As it turns out, controlled, reliable, and empirical studies have proven what we've all known from, about mushrooms for millennia, and that's they're fucking great. And that they have many tangible benefits. Mushrooms should be protected for all natives of the Americas, just like peyote. Buffoonery, religious misgivings, and bad press have negatively affected the legal status and reputation of mushrooms. It's unwarranted and always has been. People of this continent would do well to change the narrative of mushrooms. I mean, I guess we have a responsibility to improve upon the public image of mushrooms. The best thing is to refer to the science. Right now, there's tons of studies of psilocybin painting mushrooms in a positive light. We can direct traffic that way. Should we go into the rainforest and partake in uh, psychedelic tourism? I, uh, I don't know the answer to that. I think you should analyze your position of power and at least question, are you able to fully submit to your experience? Can you leave the place better than you found it? What are you doing to protect the people you seek guidance from? Are you invested in the preservation of that practice? Do you understand the forces that work against that habitat? Going vegan's the best way to save the rainforest. Should we care what Western academics have to say about psilocybin? I wouldn't ride in a car with Timothy Leary, to be honest. I think that a good ambassador of hallucinogens is, is teaching about dosage, precautions, tips, applicable information. Don't get false idled by the Christopher Columbuses of entheogens, know what I mean? Now, I can't say for sure if without R. Gordon Wasson, people in the United States would have learned about mushrooms on the same timeline, so I'll appreciate the fact that we were shown the way by somebody. But access does not qualify expertise. As a sacrament, mushrooms provide a very personal, ego-shattering experience regardless of experience, stature, or your lot in life. There is no hierarchy. There is no doctrine. In the United States, we lionize people when they have the courage to speak of something that is taboo or prohibited. It feels good when someone you consider legitimate supports your more provocative theories and ideas. But sometimes that comes with the downfall of lending credibility in areas where it isn't necessarily due. How much research have we lost due to the bad reputation of psilocybin mushrooms, mixing them in with LSD, uh, making them all part of sort of the same mechanism? And when you're talking about mushrooms, that question expands to mycology as a whole. That question expands to the landscape of the world as a whole. Mushrooms are an integral part of the world, and uh, mycology is a very understudied practice. We need to understand that mycology is our beginning, and it is our end as well. Mushrooms provide the backbone of our soil. Beautiful.
be cool, y'all. Hello, how are you doing today? All right, we'll get a closer look here. Let's see what we got. All right, let's see. Go ahead and open your mouth. Wider. All right, good, good, good. All right, all right. Okay. All right. Let's go ahead and take a look. A couple things here real quick. All right, I want you to go ahead and take a deep breath. Now exhale. Deep breath in, and let's get another exhale there. Great, great, great. Thank you. All right. Put that there. Uh, so what it looks like here is uh, we're gonna need you to go ahead and give this video a like. Go ahead and subscribe to the channel also, and. Hit the bell and uh, get those notifications also. Uh, what I'm going to do here is uh, I'm going to go ahead and get you a prescription for uh, some of my past videos. And uh, we'll get you that written out. Uh, my receptionist will get you taken care of out there and we'll get you on your way. All right. Well, it's good to see you again. Uh, look forward to our next visits and uh, have, a, have a good one. Thanks.